The following is a podcast1.com production. Hey, everybody, I need your help on this, okay? Now, dig this. Smart people like you know that podcasting is the easiest and best way to get access to great creative programs like this one. That's right, this is a creative program. That's why we're asking you to help make podcasting part of the South by Southwest Festival next March in Austin. Just go to podcast1.com now and click the Vote for Podcasting banner to help put Podcast One founder, my main man, Norm Pattis, on the big stage at South by Southwest, where he and a panel of experts will discuss how podcasts are the only place that can still push creative boundaries and give you what you really want. Quality entertainment, when you want, where you want, and that's the bottom line. Go to podcastone.com and click the Vote for Podcast banner. But do it soon, because voting ends Friday the 6th. I need your help now. Do it. And that's the bottom line, because I said so. The following program is a Podcast One.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, and an occasional side trip to Mexico, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, from the Onnit.com Total Human Optimization Studio, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. Got Mo Darwin sitting across from me. Mo's got a smile on his face. We're working out of the studios, the Steve Austin Home Studio at 316 Gimmick Street. Welcome to the crib, Mo. Oh, man, it's great to be here. What a crib. There's all these lights and uh, clocks everywhere and skulls everywhere. It's just really fan. It's pretty amazing in here. This kind of my, this kind of my man cave. I got this little table set up over here, and my wife's got her, you know, bill band desk over there, but... I told her, man, I said, I got to have a system where I can put my board, my computer, yeah. and get my whole setup going. So, you know, it's a little bit more. You know, we're trying to up our quality. We're trying to get a little bit more production value. So we got this mixer board we're running through. Uh, I actually wanted a bigger table than this. But this is what I had to barter for with my wife. This table is about... I don't know, 40 by 40, and I wanted something a little bit bigger and just because, as you can see, we've got it all covered up, yep. and we don't even have shit out yet. Yeah. So it is what it is. But, yeah, this, this is kind of my, my man cave room. i got my neon clocks going. i got my Fender Stratocaster signed by the one and only Stevie Ray Vaughan. I don't know if you saw that over I there. I did see that. That thing is nice. My wife got that for me. Uh, we were walking in a French quarters in New Orleans when I was filming the Expendables. I had a couple of days off. We were walking around drinking uh, beer and Bloody Marys. I'd stop and get a dozen raw oysters here and there. And we went to a memorabilia shop. And I wanted to get that thing, but me being the cheapskate that I am, I didn't. Six months later, as if on my birthday or anniversary, my wife had gotten that guitar for me, haggled them down. Had it sent to two forensic specialists. That is the real McCoy. Now, that's not one that he played in concert. That's uh-huh. simply a Fender Strat that he signed. So it's kind of my pride and joy, no pun intended, because that's a Stevie Ray Vaughan song, as we all know. Yeah. When I leave to the ranch, Mo, that guitar goes in my Fort Knox gun safes because there's going to be a lot of things happen. But someone busting in my house and stealing my Stevie Ray Vaughan guitar because I didn't have it locked up in a safe ain't going to happen. Yeah, not only that, you said that you also keep your 30-pound crystal skull in your Fort Knox safe as well Dude, when you leave. This skull I got right behind me. Uh, I'll, I'll put a picture on the uh, on the website, but this skull weighs about 25 or 30 pounds. It was given to me by my good friend Rick Maverick from Starling Gear Jewelry. Check that out on the website. If you want some cool-ass, badass jewelry, go to starlinggear.com. But Rick Maverick gave me that skull, and uh, I told him, I said, this is so cool. You cannot give it to me. I said, I will hang on to it for you. Yeah. Whenever you want it back, come get it. Yeah. And when I leave the house, if I'm gone for a couple of days, that skull goes in the Fort Knox safe. Make sure nobody steals it because I can't replace it. No, man, that thing is immaculate. I've never seen anything like it. You Every, can you can kill somebody with that skull. <laughs> you can hit somebody in the head with that son bitch and do a lot of damage. Now now just uh, just to go on record, I'm not planning on killing anybody with it, but if you wanted to you could. Let me ask you something. If someone was in here trying to steal your guitar, would you kill him with the skull? <laughs> I would go to my Fort Knox safe and grab my gun and then do something. <laughs> <laughs> Swinging that skull around, I think I'd probably pull a hernia. Well, well what that. if you just had a pick between each? You either had to finish him off with the skull or finish him off with the guitar. Oh, I'd well, have to finish him off with the skull. Okay. <laughs> Nothing happened to that guitar. Okay. I wish I could play that guitar. I'm just happy to sit there and look at it and be proud of it. Uh, 
Shit, man, what's going on? Uh, you know what? I, I want uh, to say thanks a lot to uh, everybody for downloading the Steve Austin show. Man, we've been kicking ass on this thing. Yeah. The numbers are, are really good. It's been uh, people are downloading this show all over the world. So, man, I want to say thank you. A shout out to the working man and the working woman out there for, you know, hey, man, that's what life's all about. Hard work. You dig it, right, Mo? Yeah, uh, man, I dig it big time. We got some great fans. You know, you have a great fan base. Your fans are really active on social networks. Uh, they care about the show. They care about you. They followed your career. They're wrestling fanatics. Uh, they're really awesome people. Well, yeah, speaking of social media, uh, you can follow me at Steve Austin BSR, and I'm going to speak up for my workforce down at the Broken Skull Ranch at Ted Fowler361. You can check him out on Twitter. He's my right-hand guy down there at the ranch. And, of course, Mo, you're on Twitter. Yeah. Where you at? At Mo Darwich, M-O-D-A-R-W-I-C-H-E. Hey, man, I want to get one more uh, plug. Basically, this is an interesting show. Let me get this plug out first. Uh, I hadn't talked about my Miopta 4x12x50 scope in quite some time, and we got a couple of those things left. Any of you hunters out there, this is a special edition scope, the same exact rig that I have my, on my number one South Texas hunting rig, and uh, Miop, Miopta optics are probably the best optics you've never heard of. They make a lot of the lenses that go into a lot of the high-end scopes with a different name on them. So, uh, man, I grew up shooting Leopold, Nikon, Bushnell, stuff like that. But if you want to take the old Pepsi challenge, put this Miop to 4x12x50 up against anything that I just named. It'll blow its ass out of the water. You can check it out at bsrscope.com. Mo, I thought today we'd do a little Q&A, man. Uh, we've had a lot of people in the studio as of late. We've been interviewing a lot of people and that's all fine and dandy yeah. because I've uh, had a lot of fun talking to some of these folks. And I, in particular, had a lot of fun talking to Nature Boy Ric Flair. You were yeah. in the hotel room with me. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Man, I had an amazing time just listening to you and Nature Boy Ric Flair. That was a schooling on the last 60 years of wrestling. It was fantastic. Man, he was uh, fun to talk to. And then recently, you know, Jerry Lawler called in. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to talk to Jerry Lawler in person. It didn't work out like that, but nonetheless got a chance to talk to him for probably a two-parter yeah. on, uh, on the on the telephone, and, and that was fun. But, you know, I got to, you know. And who do we got later on in this episode? Well, we're, we're going we're gonna to talk to David Lee Roth here yeah. in a little bit. But my point was I wanted to answer a few questions for the fans because – Man, sometimes I just like enjoy shooting the, the breeze with the people that ride in and answering questions because, yeah. man, this show is for the working man. If it wasn't for people writing in, I here's a word I don't like to use, but I will use. I don't want this show to lose the organic nature that it is. It's not just a talk show. It's not just uh, where I sit down and interview people or just uh, it's about us shooting the shit. And when you people email your questions and comments and suggestions to questions at com, I'm listening. So let's uh, go to these questions, Mo. I'm going to read a couple of questions off, and uh, you can jump in on some of these too. Uh, here's one from Pete from England. Pete says, hey, Steve, did you ever have someone jump the rail and try to attack you? How do you deal with that situation? Give us the 411 on how wrestlers and security personnel deal with this and what happens to these guys when they get dragged backstage. Any funny stories from back in the day? i got a good uh, story for you. We were over in Germany back in the day. We spent a, a week in the U.K., and then we went to Germany for a week. We always do this back-to-back. -back. And I was wrestling Triple H, who at the time was wrestled by China. And the match just got finished happening. It was the main event. I hit both of them with a stunner. One, two, three. I got the win. I came up, and I was just about to celebrate and raise my hands up in the air. And somebody tackles me from behind and takes me down and starts punching me. Now, the first thing I'm thinking is, all right, it's one of the boys from the back pulling a rib. You know, they hit the ring, yeah. as every now and then we would do back in the day. But it wasn't. It was some rambunctious fan who was cheering for Triple H in China. When I hit him with that stunner, they got pissed off. Jeez. Well, here's what happened. Hey, man, when you're in the ring with a cat, and I was a baby face at the time, and Triple H was a heel. You're always looking out for your guys back. Triple H, stand-up cat. He picked that dude up, slammed him, and started punching his lights out. And he's yelling to the security guard, get your ass in here. And the security guard didn't know where to shed a wine his watch. He was confused. You know, it happened so fast. 
and I couldn't do anything. You know, I couldn't help beat the guy up. Yeah. I'm the baby face. Yeah. But Triple H was watching my back, and he beat the snot out of that guy. And uh, I went backstage, and I had a couple of words with the guy. And I didn't take a cheap shot at him or nothing uh-huh. like that, but I had a little come-to-Jesus meeting with him and let him know how I felt. But I always gave Triple H credit for doing that. But the thing about it is, when you pay your money to come into that building, You've earned the right to voice your opinion, cheer, boo, do whatever yeah. to the wrestlers. And we expect that. Yeah. You don't want to be spit on. You don't want to be punched, slapped, none of that. But when someone crosses those rails, when someone comes between those ropes, you're considered fair game. And by and large, brother, back in the day, if you jumped in the ring, you would get your ass handed to you <laughs> in a hurry for a shoot. That's how we dealt with that problem. Was he dropping potatoes on you? Was he getting you good, or was he'd he only got of... a couple in on me? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it happened so fast. I mean, Triple H was big, laying was there. Was he a big guy or no? No, he was just a medium sized guy. Jeez. He was just rowdy. He was a little bit buzzed getting, up, getting beaten up by Triple H. Oh, dude, Triple H ba- basically cat. he bellied a back suplexed him, got on top of him, and started punching his <laughs> lights out. It was hilarious. <laughs> But, you know, I always appreciate uh, Triple H for standing up for me like that and watching my back. Here's one uh, coming from a, a guy named Todd. Hey, Steve, I remember you used to wear an earring in the mid-'90s. How come you stopped wearing it? Did you think it made you look less stone cold? Man, I'll never forget when I showed up with that crystal earring down at my dad's South Texas hunting trip, I mean fishing trip, and he saw that earring in my ear, and my dad didn't raise us like that. Yeah. And he goes, Stephen? Is that an earring in your ear? <laughs> of course it was an earring in my ear. And I said, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, what in the hell are you wearing that for? So I had to break down the whole explanation that I thought it was cool. And I was trying to have a, a look for, for television purposes because I was a pro wrestler. Uh-huh. But anyway, so that being said, I had that earring for a while. And I thought it was kind of cool. But then, you was know, this before Stone Cold days or during? This, this was as uh, Stunning Steve. As Stunning, okay. Stunning Steve seems like he'd have an earring. Yeah, and Stone Cold did have an earring for a brief moment when I yeah. first came in as a ringmaster, and then I kept it for a little while. And I said, "Hey, you know what? You know." And and no offense to uh, to to guys out there that wear earrings these days that think they're cool. It, it's just a personal choice. I don't think they're hideous. I don't think they're rotten. Yeah. It just wasn't part of what I was trying to portray, you know, th- then moving forward. So I removed it. And, you know, the same thing I, I feel about tattoos. I've yeah. got two of them. And I love looking at people's tattoos and artwork and stuff like that. But just for myself, it wasn't how I wanted to represent. So that's why I lost the earring. It just uh, it was kind of cool, I thought, for the, the time being. But it was time for me to uh, evolve and take the next step. Here's one for you. This is from uh, Danny T. Your thoughts on hazing of young slash new talent showing up in organizations. Your thoughts in general of hazing. Do you agree? Some of it? Not at all. There was just recently an incident in the uh, newspaper that one of the football teams that was playing, their whole band had basic no, it was their cheerleading squad, uh-huh. had basically been dissipated or cut off because of some hazing incidents. And I'll tell you what, it's all fine and dandy when you join the football team or whatever. Maybe someone gives you a buzz cut or you got to go run some errands for a cat. But some of these hazing things have really taken a, a turn, and a, a, a downward spiral. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of sexual, graphically sexual instances instances are happening. And to me, that is utter and complete horseshit. Yeah. If you want to do something to kind of initiate a cat into you know the club, so to speak, uh-huh. that's one thing. But anything that goes above and beyond a two or three on a scale of ten on the Richter scale, if you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. I'm not down with what's your thoughts on that. Hazing. I I agree with hazing to a certain extent. I think it's a, a rites of passage for men or women going into a specific club. But with that being said, there should be guidelines that should never be crossed. It should be an unwritten rule that you do not cross these lines sexually, uh, physically. I know you know a lot of college kids have have lost their lives over people hazing them. You know, getting kids really drunk, putting them in trunks of cars, and then just forgetting that they put them in the trunk of a car, you know? So shit like that could happen. So I think 
responsibly hazing is allowed, should be allowed. I'm down with that, responsibly, but yeah. sometime left to their own devices. Yeah. Many people aren't responsible. Yeah. So with that being said, there, there has to be a standard set because some of the stuff that I hear about these days, I mean, hey, man, I guess I must be uh, turning in back into a caveman or maybe i am uh, <laughs> been around too long. But, you know, I just never have in my whole athletic endeavor – Getting into wrestling business, high school football, college football, I, I never was a guy that was hazed. I didn't join a frat. No, yeah. no disrespect to anybody that's in a frat. It just wasn't my cup of tea. But, you know, I hope, man, I, I'll put it this way. I'll play the part of homie. Homie, don't play that shit. Okay? <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm just not down with it. I'll pay my dues. I go get, get a cat a tray of food, something like that. But any of my human barriers busted, broken, insulted, infringed upon, I'll whip a man's ass. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, here's another question. Check it out. This is from uh, Lance. Lance over in Australia. Massive fan. Always wanted to know, where do you think you'd be today if it wasn't for your successful career in pro wrestling? Swig of water for the working man. Me and Mo drinking Pellegrino right now. Swig of, Pellegrino. Swig of water for the working man right here. What would I be doing had I not got into pro wrestling? I'll tell you what, uh, I've been asked that many times, and I thought I'd go ahead and try to answer that again today. I have no earthly idea. I know that I was driving a forklift, loading unloading trucks before I got in the wrestling business. They wanted to pull me off the dock, put me through the office program, train me how to be an office regional manager in the terminal freight system, in the trucking industry. Uh, I said no can do. I wanted to go into pro wrestling and ended up here. Also, when I was in high school, I took one of those little circle tests, little gimmick things yeah. that kind of shows where your interests are at, are at, and it pointed me in the direction of being a park ranger. So, you know, I didn't want to be a park ranger. It sounds okay. Uh, worked okay for Yogi Bear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, man, I honestly don't know. The only reason I'm out here in Los Angeles doing some acting and hosting of reality television was because of the fact that I had the career in pro wrestling, and it, you know, opened the door for me to come into this uh, area of entertainment. So that's how I ended up here. But to go back and answer your question, I don't know. I can only imagine that I would probably be still doing something in the vein of heavy manual labor. Yeah, you might you might even be a truck driver. Oh, dude, I could like I could have been a truck driver, man. Breaker, 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 breaker. One night, hey. Uh, breaker for radio. How about a radio check? Uh, I, I was talking to a uh, truck driver the other day. He sent me a couple of emails. I've been talking about CBs. I've been uh -huh. talking about. There was one I drove down to Texas in the suburban. Yeah. And I said, man, I got to get a CB for this thing. And this guy started corresponding back and forth with me on the email. And CBs have come a long way. Uh -huh. I mean, there's about a five or six email exchange about, you know, all these boosters, amps, and I can't even go through all the terminology. Wow. But these cats are, I mean, they're, they're like, like a DJ booth rolling down the road. <laughs> you see, they, they got all these jacked up CBs in there, and if you ain't got a badass CB with some depth and sound behind it, yeah. you ain't shit. They, well, the CB, no, the truck drivers take their CBs seriously. Well, they got their CBs, they got their beds back there. Those are like pimp little studio apartments driving. Yeah, but you know the thing about driving, and I love driving, but, man, you drive, you know, say, I always drive 1,000 miles the first day. Yeah. Uh, and it, even on a, on a mid-range day, if I'm just driving 500 miles, that's still a pretty good piece. But let's just figure these guys, I'm just saying for argument's sake, they're averaging seven, 800 miles a day. Man, that's a lot of work. You're just yeah. sitting there, you're driving, but then, you know, you can have your AC, but you just feel grungy after that. You just want to take a shower. You just want to get cleaned up and chill. So, yeah, they got those compartments back there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's it's home on the road, and it beats checking into a hotel, I think, because yeah. I like to stay out of hotels. That's why I like my RV when I had one. But, hey, man, driving them trucks is a lot of damn work. It's tough. You know what's tough? What? Uh, because we have driven back and forth to Texas the past few times in the SUV because uh -huh. we sold our RV. Is trying to eat healthy on the road. And eating those, uh, I won't mention the national food chain that I stopped at. That's how I invented the CGF factor <laughs> from that road trip. But it's hard to be a truck driver and eat, you know, clean breast of chicken, 
plain white rice, stuff like that. They're forced to eat shit. Well, those places don't exist on the side of the road. You're not no. you're not driving through Los Angeles every day where you got a bunch of chicks that and like dudes who want to look slim that go to these types of places. There's real food on the road. Yeah, but the, you know, but there also is. There's a couple places where you can do it. Yeah, you know, you can get a Waffle House, you can get plain grilled chicken breast, you can get hash browns just you know, steamed. Uh huh. So you can eat clean. You can go to Denny's and get egg whites. But when you get the munchies, yeah. the last thing you want to do is order a bunch of, you know, boneless, skinless chicken breasts and some white rice. You want a big ass, uh, you know, like, like a moons over my hammy sandwich, uh-huh. uh, just some kind a of double, sourdough double jack, from yeah, in and out. a double double animal from in and out. style, yeah. Big ass diet coke to wash it down, or if yeah. you go to coke, that's even double damage because of the sugar. And a diet coke ain't really cutting you any favors. Yeah. But my point is, when you're on the road, you pull over, you don't want to order nothing clean. But you know, I feel when you're in your home setting, you normally don't eat these shitty foods right when you're living at home in your normal routine right when you're on the road you almost feel like you get a hall pass like this is a vacation yeah. for me you're right so i could splurge right now yeah. but the problem is your body is not used to you splurging so the cgf comes in hard but here but here's the thing on the hall pass when you're just starting to eat too much junk food man all of a sudden you get in that that mode oh, yeah. and it's kind of the domino effect and you can get away with it one, two, three, four, five times, and all of a sudden six, seven, eight, nine, as it keeps going on, you start looking and feeling like shit. Hey, supersize me. Have you yeah. ever watched that yeah, documentary? Yeah. yeah, you saw it. Yeah, I watched it. The first it's so funny, the first couple days it was really hard for him to stomach all this food. But once he got past that, yeah, it was just like second nature. But then you saw the domino effect on his body. I think he still has um health problems. From that whole really? that whole thing he did, yeah. Well, he paid the price for that. Hey, he got he got the fame out of it too. Hey, man, so so man, we're just we're just uh, shooting the breeze here, and we're talking about some questions. But yeah. hey, check up, check in. What do you want to call it? I gave you the DDP yoga program. It's been a couple of days since yeah. the last time we talked. How's it going? I did uh, some more DDP yoga yesterday. He's got this thing called um, I want to say it's called something resistance. Where you you use your own um, use your own body to create resistance with movements that you do. So because of it, you keep your body at full flex. It jacks your heart rate up. It's really easy on your joints. It's a great workout, man. It's really a great you workout. More flexibility out of it. It's really surprising. I I am. I'm actually, I could bend a lot deeper than I was able to bend before. Not only that, cardiovascular wise, like I'm breathing better. Um, I used to do a lot of yoga, right? And yoga turns off a lot of people because they think it's, you know, happy, go lucky, breathe, one with nature, bullshit. This is not that type of yoga. This is a hard cardio, physical, intense workout from start to finish. Are you enjoying it? I am enjoying it. I am enjoying it. You know, there's there's a Has thing. Has it improved your sex life? Have you improved your core strength enough for that to hey. have paid benefit? Hey, let me tell you something. I was pumping like a champ the other night. <laughs> pumping like a <laughs> champ. <laughs> My man, give me Mo with the DDP yoga program. We're going to check in with Mo in another week, see how that pump factor is going. we got a name for everything here on this show. Hey, man, let's do another question before we get into a little bit of David Lee Roth. Let's do it. He says, uh, it's from Miguel over in Puerto Rico. Hey, a little love for my Puerto Rico people down there. Hey, Steve, my name is Evan, and my question is, your transition to a podcast entertainer seems to have been a very fluent one. Where did you learn your interviewing and journalism skills needed for the show? <laughs> hey, first of all, appreciate uh, the compliment. I don't know if it was fluid or not, Uh but nonetheless, it's on the job training. I listen to some of these cats these days, most guys on the radio, yeah. and they're like artists, scientists, laying it down and never stuttering. And I, man, sometimes I got a herky jerky voice. I never know which voice I'm going to wake up with. It is what it is. The thing about this show, this is audio whoop ass. This is hard to screw up. So it can be anything and everything. Now, we always try to do as good a job as we can, try to make the production values as high as possible. But, hey, this show is a work in progress. But I appreciate your compliment. It's on the job training. But you train for this. Uh, am, I, am I right? I, What's your background? I trained in acting, but it's very different. Um, 
I've realized, and I was, he has something, he's very right here, Miguel, um, because Steve, you have impressed me with the way you do reads. An audio read is a very tough thing to do, especially when you're reading something for a sponsor. You do it flawlessly. It's very natural. And I think we had talked about it. You said it was from your days of cutting promos. Well, you know, for me, if we're trying to read somebody's copy, we're trying to sell some products for yeah. them. And, man, I tell you what, if someone's going to say, hey, Steve, you know, it's, it kind of goes back to the days in pro wrestling trying to sell tickets. You know, if you'll notice, all the stuff that we've been uh, talking about on this show uh, from uh, Stamps.com, Make Your Life Easier, doing that stuff, all the products from on it, which on I it, take yeah. and believe in, uh, virtually all the stuff that we read, I dig and I believe in. So, hey, man, if, if they're going to say we're going to give the Steve Austin show a chance to sell some of our stuff and jump on and be a sponsor, I want to do a good job for them. Hey, there you go. But So I'm excited about it. Uh, and that being said, I'm a guy – that will not listen to the radio because I hate commercials. Yeah. I cannot, and, and I, man, same thing watching TV. I hate commercials. So we've got to have these sponsors on the show to keep our show on the air for free. Yeah. So if I'm going to make you listen to a commercial, I will make it good. I'm going to make it entertaining. And, you know, I'm selling it. Maybe you'll dig it. Maybe you'll buy it. But at the end of the day, it's all entertainment. So we try to make it so on the show. Yeah, maybe it'll be in Espanol for our man Miguel. Well, maybe we'll start doing the whole show in Espanol. Maybe not. <laughs> How many minutes we got there on the dial? Oh, uh, we go. We got man. 24 we, minutes, we man. We got at least 10, 15. Oh, man. We got 10, 15 more? Yeah, we got about 10, 15, yeah. Okay, let's talk about it then. Uh, got another question here. This is from Jason. He says, no, this is from Brenda. This is from Brenda. Brenda says, my dad and I used to watch wrestling when I was a little girl. Not so sure he'd like to watch today with all the soaps and showboating. Do you like wrestling better now or 20 years ago? That's from Brenda. Brenda, how are you? I am happy that you downloaded the show. The Steve Austin Show audience is about 90% male. We're trying to increase our female audience. Yeah. But that being said, we ain't changing nothing. So anyway, thanks for downloading the show, and I'm glad you enjoy it. And to answer your question, uh, man, I dig wrestling 20 years ago. You know, I dig wrestling uh, 10 years ago when I was still in the ring. But, you know, if I was going to be in my garage right now doing some cardio, I'd put on NWA mid-80s. Or I'd put on Mid South Power Pro in mid eighties uh era, that kind of stuff when, you know, people down there in in the Carolinas and the Crockett promotions were Full Horsemans, Nikita Koloff, Dusty Rhodes, of course, Rick Flair, uh Tully Blanchard, Ole Anderson, uh Ricky Morton, uh Robert Gibson, the Rock and Roll Express, Jim Cornette, Midnight Express, uh Magnum T A, uh before he had his crash. I mean that's just uh going through a couple of the cats that were back there. Down and you know, million dollar med, million dollar med, Ted DiBiase down there in mid south, Jake and Snake Roberts, fabulous free birds, Jim Ross, of course, calling that action, Lance Russell down there in Crockett. So, anyway, that's what I dig, and I'm not uh, not crapping on today's product. You try to watch a little bit of wrestling these days, don't you, Mo? I, I have been trying to watch a little bit this day. Uh, it's different, man, it's it just doesn't have. And maybe because I'm older now and I'm not younger. You know, when I was younger, it was just, it was larger than life. But the characters are just different for me. Um, I, I don't see as much commitment to character. And, and like you had said, I, I see a lot of people trying to play the part. I don't, I don't see the believability in it. Like these people aren't really that person. And that's what I'm looking for. If you'll remember, Mo, a couple of weeks back, we had Little Egypt on our show. And we talked about the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Yeah. And we talked about that DVD and that whole uh, process as it lasted from about 1986 to 1990. And how interesting and unique and distinct all of those characters were on that show. And, yeah, some of them were a little uh, over the top. But you believed in those characters. Yeah. And they did a great job at that. And I, I just think maybe, and I'm not crapping on today's business, uh, it just seems to be that, all of the ideas for these characters are coming from the same person. Yeah. So they kind of all remind me of all just one persona that runs in and out through all the different performers. And maybe they all look kind of the different kind of, you know, I don't know what I'm saying. I just, you know, well, I agree with, look, it's like movies today. It's become so corporate that everyone's playing it so safe. 
So and, and we could do all these cool things like explosions and graphics and guys could do flips and all these things. But what they're forgetting about, it's about the relationships. It's about the, the drama between the two human beings, that connection and making that real. And I think that's what we're missing right now. I think also to, to, to be nitpicky and not trying to come down on the, the company is I, I think – People are playing it too safe right now. Yeah. And certainly it's a PG environment. I dig that. I understand that. That's where the corporate money is. That's smart. But it doesn't mean that you can't be loud. It don't mean that you can't be rough. It don't mean that you can't be aggressive. Right now everybody's kind of slick and polished. I'd like to see someone really define and come up with a badass gimmick and let her fly without any cares of, uh, you know, being reined in or pulled back in. Yep. But anyway, let's let's go ahead and stop that conversation because I'll spin out of control and go crazy. Let me tell you something. If I was a corporate sponsor right now, I would go after that hard, edgy, crazy son of a bitch because there is a whole herd of people that want to follow that. And any sponsor that's down with that, hey, I'm gonna buy that. I'm gonna buy that ticket. But again, man, you got to look at the whole machine in general. Yeah, yeah that, that that one edgy cat. That was me back in the day. Oh yeah. But in today's game, it, it's changed. Yeah. And uh, you know, and now at least uh, not 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 so much that he's an edgy cat, but you know, John Cena. Yeah. At home on the sidelines, the torn tricep. Sheamus uh, at home with uh, two torn uh, what's it, labrums in his uh, shoulders. He's getting those fixed. Uh, Daniel Bryan coming to the forefront with a hell of a push. Uh, yeah. All the corporate backing. Right now is a hell of a chance for someone to to stand up and make a name for themselves. Yeah. They've got some interesting young characters in development down there, and uh, maybe some of them are a little bit green. But right now, the time is now. If you want to seize a spot with now. two top guys down, this is a dream situation when yeah. you're a talent. Now, from overall picture, you never want your top two guys to go down. Never, yeah. But believe me, when I got taken off, you know, and on the put on the sideline when I had to have my neck surgery. Yeah, no one was happy about it, but from a work standpoint, hey, man, if there ain't a bunch of sharks out there sniffing on that chum ready yep. to take that spot, yep. there's something wrong. So yep. to any of you cats in the WWE, strike now. If you're going to strike, strike now. Here's check it. Check it out. Here's another question here, Mo. Hey, Steve, I'm a huge fan of your career in the podcast. i got a quick question. I know you're a music guy, so I was curious about your WWF entrance theme and the different variations that it took on. How much input did you have into your theme? And of the different versions, which was your favorite? Eh, you know, uh, Jim Johnston is the musical genius that is back behind the scenes that comes up with all these musical themes for all these WWE superstars. And I remember when I was talking to Jim and I pitched Bulls on Parade, by Rage Against the Machine. That's that a good was one. that was what my music was based on, and that was the idea that sprung him to write and create exactly what he did. The sirens in the background, that was his idea. The music, I mean, the glass breaking at the beginning, that he pulled that out of his ass. I mean, he's a genius. So Jim Johnston created that whole ball of wax from just my idea that it should be born from bulls on parade by bulls on parade by rage against machine so uh out of all the different variations with uh disturbed uh what's the name of that band disturbed yeah yeah disturbed yeah i, I forget who all made so many copies of my damn entrance music they're all the same to me when it all goes back to it i think i preferred the original one written by jim johnston yeah you ever been to a rage against the machine concert I would have loved to have gone to a Rage Against the Machine concert, but no, I have not. You? I went to go see them at Coachella um, when they had reunited after being apart for, I think, six or seven years. I waited at the front of the line, um, was there for probably five, six hours before the concert started. At about three hours before the concert started, about 60,000 people deep started just pushing you into the gates. Right. People are crowd surfing out because they're freaking out. But right when that music started, right, all of a sudden all those people that were pushing up against each other, half of them left because it turned into a huge mosh pit. So any, the only people with balls were in that mosh pit. It was the best concert of my life. I, I literally probably touched the ground twice because I was floating so high, jumping, getting thrown around. It was out so of body. Are you one of those kind of guys that likes to jump in a mosh pit? 
You know, sometimes I do. You know, a responsible mosh pit, yeah. A responsible mosh pit is huge. And it's it's always the biggest guys who seem to be the most responsible. They're not in there trying to throw elbows and knock right. people out. They're, they're jamming. They're in there jamming, knocking each other around. And the minute a guy gets thrown to the ground, you pick him back up and you put your arm around him and you keep on going around right. in a circle. But some some people go out there to get all looped up. Yeah. And it turns into an aggression thing, which turns into a fight, which turns into a cluster. Yeah. And that sucks ass. Yeah. Ain't nothing worse than some idiot getting out of control because he's had too much to smoke, too much to drink, or oh. whatever it was, and it's turned into an instant asshole. Yeah. If there's one thing I can't stand. If there's one thing I can't stand. <laughs> I remember uh, I, I, I always watch a, a lot of Rage videos, and that one concert they had at the Olympic Auditorium. Uh-huh. Man, as soon as they start... I mean, those people start jumping up and down yeah. and coming over the rails. I mean, they uh, – and, 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 and it's always interesting because those guys busted up. And Zach De, Zach De La Rocha, you know, one of a kind. One of a and kind. And I keep waiting for that Tom guy Morello. to come up. Well, Tom Morello, one of a kind, and, and all of them. But as, as a unit, Rage Against the Machine. But I keep waiting for Zach De La Rocha to at least resurface in something and start making music again. Have you heard any word on the street? You know, I know he had done a little side project that didn't really go well. But that guy was so – he was so young when he started. His poetry was so deep. It was so anti-machine. You know, you know, talk about not being afraid to speak up yeah. and go against the corporate, the corporate right. thread. He was that guy. Um and I don't know. It's like maybe he just hit a point where he became too mainstream. And for a guy like that, it's just not worth it for him anymore. And, and, he, and he, he he went out on top. Man, well, I mean, he's still he's got to come back. Uh, yeah. I, I have a hard time seeing a guy who's that creative and that intelligent resting on the sidelines. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, the other three guys went on to hook up with Chris Gornell. Yeah. And that was, dude. With I remember Slave. with Audio Slave, yeah. their first song, Coach Eyes, yeah. when it came out the bat, and it just rocked. You're like, holy shit. And Chris Cornell is a hell of a singer. Hell of a but singer. the four individuals with Zach De La Rocha that make yeah. up Rage Against a Machine cannot be duplicated. Yeah. And, and and to their credit, they don't even try to imitate it. They're, they're, they have a whole different sound. Yeah. But when you listen to some of the stuff that they will sing with, uh, there was an old Rage song. Nobody sings Zach stuff like Zach. Nobody does. And, and that does no uh, disrespect to Chris Cornell, who's awesome. He caused a riot, um, I think, in downtown L.A. when they were having the presidential elections out here. And they were doing one of the candidate spe- you know, ca- candidate competitions against each other. And he did a concert in front of, in front of where they were having this. Right. And it caused a riot and loss. That's the kind of music they make stuff that like speaks to you in your core and charges you up and gets you to do stuff out of character hey, man, and that's a powerful as, cat long as it's good stuff hey man yeah, yeah. you know what Let, let's uh let's uh let's do one more question and let, let's wrap it up and see what david lee ross got to say oh, this I'm was sure he's got a lot uh inter- an interesting interview here's one from uh larry he says hey steve with everything going so well with your career to podcast movies tv shows and wrestling where do you see yourself doing in the next 10 years Man, doing exactly what I'm doing right now, doing a couple of TV shows here and there. I love the reality space. I'm yeah. digging that. I've got a, a pilot we just shot for CMT. I'm very fired up about we're going to get some word, uh, whether it's a go or no, coming up real soon. If I'm able to do a movie here or there every now and then, that's great. I'm trying to uh, come up with a hunting show for calendar show calendar year uh, 2014. So I'm yeah. looking forward to get, getting into that. But I want to keep doing this podcast stuff. I'm interested in doing stuff that I'll be able to pursue for the next 10, 15 years. That's kind of my long range plan. Uh, with that being said, I'm not a guy who really makes long range plans. I'll wake up tomorrow and then go to the next day and the next day. I got my older brother, uh, Scott in two years, he can tell you where he's going to go vacation, what they're going to do, how they're going to get there. And when they're going to leave and how it's all going to break down. Me, I'll wake up in four days. I look at my wife, say, hey, you know what? I think me and her, she's driving to Texas. She says, okay. And then I'm driving down the road to Texas. That's kind of how the way I, I roll my life. But if I had to answer your question, I'd say that. What kind of long-range plans you got, Mo? You're a young cat. Yeah. Trying to get into the acting thing, doing yeah. this, picking up some engineer stuff. Yeah. Uh, what's, in the, what's in the next 10 years for you? You know, for me, I looked at it, oh, I'll be this actor, producer type, and, and I'll be famous and in the movies and all that. And I planned on that. And, uh, you know, this year things changed. Uh, I got a new mentality. You get in where you fit in. And right now this podcast thing is, is fitting for me. 
I enjoy it. I enjoy working with you. So, you know, I'm going to be like you, man. Let's just see where the day takes me. Let me enjoy this day and then the next one. And then, you know, my intentions for what I want are out there in the world. I don't need to plan them. If it happens, it happens. I got you. I got you. But nonetheless, you got to make hay while the sun's shining. We're making hay here at 316 Gimmick Street. Uh, shit. I think we're going to call it a day. I think we're going to wrap up our conversation. We're going to go into a little bit of David Lee Roth, and then we'll bring it all back, wrap that show up. So stay tuned. Check out a conversation I had with David Lee Roth there at the Steve Austin Show Studios in Hollywood, California. Me and Mo will come back to wrap up the day. Enjoy. Well, it's about time. Fantasy football is back, and DraftKings.com is celebrating with millions in cash prizes. That's big. Millions. Millions. That's big, that's big money. Oh, it's big money, man. And it's so easy to play on DraftKings.com. And it's it's weekly fantasy sports. I love it. Well, the reason I like it is one-day games means I'm never locked into a season. So, for me, short attention span, it's like a new season every time I play. You dig that? Oh, I dig that. I can't tell you. I, I could tell you a story. Last year, when one of my first overall picks, I'm not going to name his name, mm-hmm. goes out first week with an ACL injury, ruined my entire fantasy season. Let me tell you about that. I don't have that problem at DraftKings. DraftKings is where anyone can enter with a couple of bucks with big cash prizes. You like true stories? Yeah, Here's tell, a, tell, uh, me, tell me one. Let's go. You like true stories? I love them. Well, check it out. One guy won 100 grand his very first time. Really? Bingo! $100,000 day one. That ain't bad. That ain't a bad day's work. Beginner's luck. I don't care what you call it. That's big money. Dig it. They're going to put up a million bucks kickoff week. Wow. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. You know, I think our listeners are football savvy enough to maybe win that million bucks. If they're listening to Steve Austin show, they better be football savvy. If there's one thing I can't stand, is an audience that's not football savvy. I don't know why I said that, but it makes it works for me. <laughs> hey, folks, play for free. Yeah, free at DraftKings.com. Enter Steve with your first pay game and get free entry into the Million Dollar Kickoff Bash. Seriously, folks, free entry that could win you thousands just playing fantasy football. You, Steve, at DraftKings.com. DraftKings.com. Welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I got one of my favorite cats of all time joining us, David Lee Roth, lead singer, front man, world famous. If you're going to talk about front man, David Lee Roth is always in that conversation. And for my money, he's in the top three if you ain't the top one. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking to him. You excited today too, ain't you, Mo? Oh man, I'm excited. I was just playing Van Halen in my shower, like in my bathroom while I, you know, take a shower. Dude, you weren't just, singing in the shower, were you? Yeah, dude, I was. I can't hit the level notes that he could hit, but I was going for it. Did you do a big roundhouse kick or front kick to pull a <laughs> hamstring? Yeah, I broke the glass, pulled a <laughs> hamstring, cut myself. Hey man, check it out. Uh, you know, I always wanted to be a rock and roll singer. That was my number one goal in life was to be a rock and roll singer, but. But, you know, I couldn't sing. I yeah. couldn't sing worth the shit. So my dad played in a country and western band. And so then uh, I got him to teach me how to play lead guitar. Mm-hmm. Except I didn't apply myself in practice, so I sucked. So then, you know, I can't give up my rock and roll dreams yet. So I figured, okay, two less strings. I'll play bass guitar. So I bought a bass guitar, and he was going to teach me how to play that. But I didn't practice, so I sucked at that, too. So there goes. I can't be a lead singer because I can't sing. No yeah. work ethic to be a lead guitarist. Too lazy to play the bass and too stupid. And drums are so loud, they wouldn't buy me a drum kit. So there goes my dreams of being a rock star, just completely dashed at a very young age. So then I had to go to my backup plan, which is pro wrestling. And that's where it turned out okay. But check it out. Uh, enough about me. I want to tell my next door after I get my guest on the air. Today, I'm, goddamn, I'll tell you what, I'm happening to some bitch. David Lee Roth, the legendary front man, lead singer from Van Halen. Brother, welcome to the show. Oh, live in front of your naked, steaming eyes. I'm in the company of royalty. I feel it even over the magnetic waves as we, as we transmit stone cold. It's really a pleasure to be here. This is, I, actually, you are my first professional wrestling entertainment hero ever that I've ever really sat down around the campfire with. This is quite a special, uh, and it's the full moon. No coincidence there. This is special for me. I'll tell you what, man. I'm in Los Angeles. You're calling from New York City, right? Mm. 
I come from everywhere. I live at 36,000 feet and 600 uh, miles an hour. I spent the last year living in Tokyo, of all places. And uh, did I hear that you have your dog at your feet? I travel with my uh, Australian uh, cattle doggy Russell here. He travels with me all over the world, etc. And uh, I'm kind of a wanderer, you know, a little bit of a, a little bit of a traveler. But you know what? Plenty of professional wrestling on the television in Tokyo. All the regular shows are there. And here, let me let you in a little secret. All rock stars, at least in, in hard rock and heavy metal, wish they looked like you and could push a button and become you at least one weekend a month. Did you know that? <laughs> well, you know, due to those people, they got a chance to live vicariously through the action of Stone Cold Steve Austin, and it was a good thing to be Stone Cold because I had a lot of fun doing that damn uh, that job. I want to drop a story on you real quick. It goes back to 1989, 1990. I was just breaking into business in Dallas, Texas. I'd been training for about two months. The heels were beating the shit out of me. Finally, I told the promoter, when can I start working full time? He says, I think you're ready. So I was driving my ass down to Tennessee. And there I was. Uh, and I started out, and I was a baby face. I was a good guy. I had long blonde hair, had a pretty good physique, long, colorful tights. And uh, I was out there, and it really sucks when you don't really have a lot of talent yet, and you're green in the business, and presentation is everything. And certainly a great entrance is a big part of who and what you are in the statement that you're trying to make. And I didn't have any entrance music because I was that green rookie. And I was noticing all these guys walk to the ring in 1990 in all the Tennessee territory, and I had to walk out to a symphony of silence. That's very hard. That does not instill any confidence. So being the big Van Halen fan that I am and was at the time, I figured, man, i got to have something cool that hits hard and just starts in with some aggression as a cool tune. So I said, I got it, I got it. So I basically got my little cassette recorder, recorded Unchained, and I handed it to the guy at the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis. I said, hey, man, when they call my name, play this song. And he looked at me, and he said, you don't deserve to have any music being played before you come out there. And, you know, basically, you know, my, my career's on the line. I'm a rookie, greener than a son bitch in the business. This guy's going to tell me I don't deserve music. Anyway, I conned him into playing the music. I came out to Unchained, and I was still green, but I had a badass song going for me. So I have that to owe you. And then, about a year, year and a half later, I turned heel. I turned into a bad guy. I returned to Dallas, Texas to take on my mentor in a student versus teacher angle. Well, I needed something wicked, bad, cool, tough. So I came out with Running with the Devil, another classic VH tune. So, brother, you and me go way back, and though we've never met, we've got to do this show one of these days in person. I need to come do the Raw show with you so we can sit down and shoot the shit together. Well, these kinds of songs, as you've just described, have a wicked sense of humor and real sharp teeth at the same time, just like real people. A lot of times, this kind of hard rock serves you up a one-dimensional kind of a cartoon where it's all just happy or it's all just angry, mid-level fury, we'll call it. And with Van Halen music, there's a kind of a dark sense of humor to it that... Uh, Frankly, a whole lot of people have literally marched off to war to that music. A whole lot of people have celebrated with great big smiles. A whole lot of a whole lot of uh, relationships were consummated, and a whole lot of families were started to that music, <laughs> and a whole lot of punches were thrown to that music as well. It's great verb. And music stirs up the metabolism. Anything, anything from fried chicken, pickles, and uh, iced tea in a thermos on a picnic, all the way up to a fist-to-face conference. Confrontation, 12 rounds of uh, a genuine hilarity in the ring. Van Halen music works perfectly for it. It's, it's better than coffee, actually. Well, and you can't OD on it. I encourage you to overdose. But break it down for me. You're going to sit down and write a tune. What's the motivation? Does it happen at once? Do you think about something that just pops in your mind and you get the proverbial napkin at the diner and just it writes itself in five minutes? Take me to, through your songwriting process because I'm dying to know how you did this. Nine times out of ten, if somebody tells you that they were just sitting in the middle of the room and, and it just sort of came to them, it arrives at moon in June, rhymes with spoon. Uh, when's that going to happen? Uh, sometime uh, soon. Oh, excellent. Write that shit down. And uh, you get it becomes alarmingly familiar. 
I'm, I'm always collecting. I take an approach that is closer to the way uh, a script writer does it, okay? Uh, the way somebody who writes for film or somebody who's a novelist, okay? Like somebody who writes, for example, The Born Supremacy, the fellow who wrote those books. You're constantly listening to other people's conversations and writing down little bits and pieces. In fact, somebody might say that thing, little bits and pieces, I'll write that phrase down. You follow? And right. uh, I'll see little things in bumper stickers. I saw a bumper sticker when I was in Texas not terribly long ago. It said, no talent, no skills, just heart. All right. Well, there's a story there. The story is about the guy driving that truck. That's a sto- That's a song waiting to be made, and it certainly sounds like a title, if not one of the lyrics. Okay. I heard somebody say on another television show, "Honey, I ain't real smart, but I can lift heavy things." Well, now that now that goes in the book, and that's certainly one of the lines in our new song called "No Talent, No Skills, Just Heart." And you start to build it the way you would. You might build a big, good argument before you have it. You know, you can start months and months and months of that. So I've always got a notebook. I'm always collecting. I'm always walking real slow. And with my dog, I have a cattle dog. He's got real short little legs. And then when you walk him before he gets to the trot, you have to walk so slow. And so nobody questions why me. I'm walking so slow past people having conversations, you follow? Because without the dog, I just look scary. What's he doing? <laughs> With the dog, well, shit, he's just walking the dog. <laughs> Dude, what's on your reading list? Cause it, yeah, I was listening to a lot of your interviews. Of course, I followed your career, you know, forever, of course. But anyway, and, and listen to you describe, uh, you know, professional wrestling. You know, I didn't know you started doing your broadcasting show called The Roth Show. And it is your epic broadcasting career, and this is not you can My go. Words. To, those not, are, not, not his, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> think of nothing that eloquent. Blog? Do we call it a bro- what do we call it a blog or whatever? Is that's that's what I wanted to know. What do we call it? In its infancy steps. <laughs> in, in its infancy steps, but if you go to davidleeroth dot com and check out the Roth Show, listeners to this particular show will be interested in episodes fifteen and sixteen because you do a couple of segments, thirty five minute segments on the history of professional wrestling. Uh, so that's why you, you got to check out the Ross show. And, and for my audience, start with 15 and 16, and then check out the rest. Dude, so what was your, when you decided to start doing this epic broadcast, what was the motivating factor here? Because you said, and I was listening to you on the Joe Rogan show, you said you love to broadcast. Is it just reaching out and entertaining your, your fans? Is it a creative outlet for you? Because I've often told Mo and some of the other cats here that, man, I got into podcasting just so I could use this as a form to unleash my creativity or some energy that I, got, I used to got to uh, unleash you know, on Monday Night Raw. So what was the motivation behind you with everything that you've got going starting this epic, epic broadcast? an excellent question. According to my sisters, I never was much good at listening in the first place. (laughs) Come on, David. So so speaking at length, (laughs) ain't much of a hurdle, Stephen. (laughs) Well, hey, let me ask you something. Watch watch this. They're the two words that'll be on my gravestone. (laughs) How long can he go? Long. <laughs> well, okay, so but what was the motivating factor? Answer me that. I love broadcasting because I grew up with it. Gotcha. In, and I grew up with it in uh, when there were three distinct different uh, kinds of broadcasting voices available to me. The very first, of course, was Screaming Boss Jock Top 40 Wrecking Crew. Hey, hopping and popping and popping with the best bet for the boss, beat at the top of the pop smash goal, I'm here with. And you, and you would imitate that right. when you before you were a teenager and try and get those voices, okay? And then you had, uh, you had uh, underground radio, you dig? And, uh, hey, that, that was just, that's very informal. It's like acting but not acting. Do you follow, like, you, you know from acting how difficult it is not to make faces, not to wink, not to use your elbow to show that it's a joke. Just stop fucking around. Like all our favorite actors, the Clint Eastwoods right. and the Chuck Bronsons, 